is ChaosCast, the Chaos Community Podcast, where we share use cases and experiences with measuring open source community help, elevating conversations about metrics, analytics, and software from the Community Health Analytics Open Source Software, or short Chaos Project, to wherever you like to listen. Welcome to this episode. This podcast is sponsored by our friends at Sustain, a community of open source enthusiasts and professionals that care about the future of open source. Learn more at sustainoss.org. On the panel today is Sean Goggins. Hi, Georg. I'm Sean Goggins, a co-founder of the Chaos Community and a computer science professor at the University of Missouri. I also maintain a project that's part of Chaos called Augur. Welcome. And myself, Georg Blink. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Good to have you listening today. My name is Georg Link. I am one of the co-founders of the Chaos Project, currently co-lead of the governing board. But by the time you're listening to this, we'll probably have elected someone else to take my place. Outside of Chaos, I'm the director of sales at Biturgia. And I'm also the lead for the IEEE SA Open Community Advisory Group. And I'm excited to have two guests joining us today, Anita and Iftika, who are going to talk with us about creating appreciative communities and implicit mentoring. And so, yeah, let's hear from you who you are and what your background is. Anita, do you want to start? Thank you, Georg, and thank you to Chaos and Sean for inviting us to this podcast. We are very excited to talk about our latest research, but introduction, I'm Anita Sarma. I am Professor of Computer Science at Oregon State University. One of my research passions is improving diversity, equity, and inclusion in tech and specifically in open source. I have been doing research on what kind of barriers exist for women entering open source. And right now we are working on how can we actually start creating a more appreciative and inclusive community, which is what we are going to speak about. Apart from this, I have been consulting and working with Georg and Vitergia to improve diversity and inclusion in the Apache Software Foundation. Awesome. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Look forward to our conversation. And Iftika. Thank you, Georg. Thank you, Sean, for inviting us. I'm really excited to be here today. So I am Iftika Ahmed, and I'm an assistant professor at University of California, Irvine. And in terms of my research interest, it has always been ensuring quality of software. And I have been looking at this quality problem from various aspects or dimensions. You know, like the typical technical stuff, like how are we writing good code? Are we writing bad code? But eventually I realized that it's the human, which is one of the most important parts uh, because it's the human who's writing the code, at least till now. So eventually uh, that led me to start going into this direction of like, okay, how can we help the human in writing code and what is affecting the health of the community or the product itself? And that led to this research with Anita. We have been looking at the human aspect from, again, from various angles, from the gender perspective. And the latest work in this line was implicit mentoring and how it has effect on the quality of the product or quality of the software. I think it's really interesting that you're coming at this from the problem of how do we create quality software and that there's more to it than testing the software and having reviews and everything that it's really focused on the people that are creating the software. I think this is something in open source and in the chaos project we have been thinking a lot about. If we understand the health of an open source project, yes, we need to understand the quality of the code, but really it is about the interactions of the people and how do we understand those through metrics? That's the question we have in the Chaos Project. But you are taking an interesting angle on what that actually means to have healthy communities. 
Exactly. So just to add on top of what you said, it's not a purely technical problem, the quantity, right? The produce software's quality. It's a socio-technical problem. And how are these humans interacting with each other? How they're communicating? What challenges they're facing? That's essentially the Pandora's box. A question for all of you is, what do you mean by socio-technical? So let me take a first stab at it and then Anissa can add. So socio-technical is the way I see it. So when we are writing code, right, in, it doesn't matter if it's open source, if it's closed source, you know, in industry, the humans have to talk with each other. And a lot of the information is not on those documentations, not on the requirement docs. It's like over the coffee break discussion or having a chat. In some places, they even use, you know, text message just to discuss things. So this is essentially one part of the socio-technical aspect that I'm referring to is, can I share the data? Can I share the information? Is it clearly understandable to the person? Do I feel okay talking with the person? Or do I feel, you know, like when I say I'm talking about the developer, do they feel some kind of hesitance or are they scared? All of those things play a role in what is the final product, right? The software that is being produced. So again, like the communication pattern, the process that is being deployed, all these things are, again, I mean, you cannot call them purely technical things that contains the human. So that's why it's a socio-technical. And especially in open source, it's, you know, spread across the whole world. People from different culture, different community, different background are contributing. So if anything, it makes it even more socio-technical than compared to anything else. So just like a computing system has dependencies, you know, we often think of it as a technical ecosystem, but it really is a socio-technical ecosystem because the humans are writing the code, the humans are reading the code, they are reading, writing documentation, and eventually, even at the end of the spectrum, is the end users often that are using the program, the product. So the humans are an integral part of this ecosystem. And because of this technical dependencies, there are social dependencies. It really matters to know who else is working on this piece of code because their changes might impact my changes. And this goes to what Ithikar was saying that, hey, we need to look at each other's code. We need to be comfortable talking about each other's code, be able to give each other feedback on the code or documentation. It is a combined effort and open source is an amazing phenomenon where these individuals are spread around the world and they're still able to coordinate, communicate and make this complex software that really forms the backbone of the digital infrastructure that we know today. I would echo just what Iftikhar and Anita are saying. I think that we have very little technology today that does not engage human beings in its use and application. And the construction of software is now very much a socio-technical enterprise. It doesn't write itself. And whether or not an open source project or any project is successful is as much a component of the human relationships and systems that we build around them as the technical ones. They're inseparable. We should just call them systems, but we have to call them socio-technical because I think a lot of people go directly to the technical when we say computer system. So a lot of the social layering is often invisible because many of these interactions are not actually archived or visible. Oftentimes what you see is only the technical components. A lot of the social interactions and layers around it, they might be hidden or they might not be persistent. And that's why it's, it's important to bring out the social aspect because that's the glue that gets to the product at the end. Absolutely. And that is reflected also in how in chaos we're thinking about the metrics. We've long realized that if we just look at the Git log and the mailing list archive, it's the conversation around the artifacts that we are producing, the source code, the documentation, but everything that goes on Outside of that, you know, the chatter at conferences or helping each other out in, in other forums and other places just gets lost if we focus only on that technical. Totally. Yeah. So one of the things that as we're talking about 
people creating software in open source communities. You already touched on the worldwide phenomenon that open source is with people coming in with different backgrounds, with different expectations, with different experiences, with different skill sets. And I understand from your research, you're really trying to understand what does it take to be productive in a gigantic community in some cases with all of these different people. So what are some things you have learned from your research? So being productive in open source means a couple of things. First is you need to have the contributors who are actually gotten the time, have interest, and can be engaged to contribute whatever they are doing. It can be code or non-code contributions. But because open source is so broad, there are very many different types of people sometimes not as many rules and structure around which the project exists, that it is hard for newcomers to figure out the landscape. Researchers actually call, have called it, it's the hostile new landscape. Like as explorer, you have to figure out by yourself, understand the technical stuff, but also the project culture, the communication and processes that go around it and start to make contributions. So there is an initial challenge before anybody can even start contributing as in finding even the right task to work on. How do I know what skills I need to finish this particular task? Because it's so open sometimes for newcomers, especially those who are not as experienced in say software production or open source to find even the starting point. So that's the first barrier to being productive. After that comes you know, to be participating, you need to get the reviews back. And I don't remember the exact statistics, but I think the largest proportion of people stop contributing because they did not get a feedback. The feedback was very delayed. By the time they got the feedback, that issue or task was already done by someone else. So it's, it's like you're all on your own trying to figure it out without as much help. Now things have gotten much better. There are a lot of documentations. There is good or best practices of labeling issues as first starter task, first issue, newcomer friendly. So it helps. And once a individual knows how to start to contribute, has figured out the landscape, they also have to then deal with how to communicate properly, how to give feedback in a good way, in an empathetic way, and also very importantly, how to take feedback. Do not take it the wrong way, but appreciate the feedback amount of effort that goes into reviewing and giving the feedback. So there are different levels at which these challenges exist to being productive. And this is because everything is voluntary. There is a lot of work pressure and resource crunch on those who are existing developers, the existing contributors, maintainers in figuring out there's this huge number of issues that come in. Who has the time to create these labels, to clean things up, to keep documentation up to date? Because of open source being a voluntary phenomenon, this is all voluntary based. And it's just amazing that the system actually works, that people are finding time to voluntarily give their time and not just doing the stuff that, you know, they have to do, but also on how to create and nurture a community. So there's a lot of ask. And sometimes because of time crunch, one thing gets done and not others. And in the past, open source developers and projects had focused more on the technical parts and not so much at the social part because they assumed it would get done because people are interested, people will figure it out. But given open source has become such a big thing, such a huge phenomenon, and it is also a really important part to get uh, hired. Recruiters are using open source profiles, contribution profiles. More and more people are interested and want to contribute. And because of that, there is this extra need for scaffolding the learning, scaffolding the processes, so that as more influx of contributors come, they can be supported, they can be engaged so that the projects can retain them. Excellent answer, Anita. And I think 
people may not realize how substantially open source has grown over the past even five to seven years. It's been just like a meteor in terms of the number of people and projects. How does that for you, Ishtakar, influence this socio-technical system of testing and quality assurance and open source software? So there are multiple facets from this explosion of number of people and number of projects, right, in open source over the last few years, over the last decade, actually, if, if I put it in that way. Because this amount of data that is being produced in terms of these artifacts, these communication logs, all these artifacts, it helps us as researchers to dig in more and see nuances or patterns that we could not see before. For example, this implicit mentoring work, this is only visible or we could look into it because that kind of conversation or that kind of communication between contributors in open source is captured now with more details. So that's the good side as a researcher. Now, from the practitioner side, I can see a bunch of issues that were previously they were prominent, but it's becoming even more prominent. So for example, number of duplicate bug reports, simply because there are more contributors, there are more end users, the number of issues or reports, bugs reported, has increased. And previously, it was well documented that dealing with this kind of gigantic number of bug reports, duplicate bug reports to be specific, is a not wastage, but requires a lot of resource that does not lead to a successful bug triaging. So those are issues that have become even more prominent. And of course, as researchers, we are trying to build tools and techniques that are like more efficient in terms of identifying these problems. And then of course, because the diversity of contributors has increased, we are seeing different phenomena. For example, one thing that we have in a different research, I have seen that previously people used to submit bug reports textual, right? We have been trying to give template how to write a good bug report, actionable bug report. And then Later on, people started adding screenshots to show the problem. Now, in recent years, a trend is emerging is adding videos or screen captures of the bug so that the developer can actually see the bug in action. Again, that's a very long answer to your question. But to summarize, as a researcher, I'm seeing good side because of the data, because of the variations in interactions. And of course, it's creating new challenges for the practitioners. But of course, that's where the thing is, right? If you're not facing challenges, then the thing is dead. If you're not facing challenges, the thing is dead. <laughs> yeah, so that, that might be. Is it like the emptiness of life if you've achieved everything and are living on your own wealthy island? Or tell me a little more about that. So that's the testing person in me. So like, it's always a moving target, right? right. It's always a moving target. So if things are going smooth for a very long period of time, that means either it's not being pushed to its limit or like no one is using it. So, you know, either way we want, again, it's of course not only applicable to open source, but any software, if it is yes. not being used, then as a creator, my purpose of creating it is kind of defeated. So that's why that if it's not moving, it's dead that like it may sound a bit too harsh, but it's a moving target. So, you know, we have to always keep at it so that we can do the best. That's sure. kind of how I approach it. Is that similar, you think, to the what I'd see as sort of a common open source theme where a project achieves a certain level of success, which leads to additional demands on it. And usually at the moment that it happens, projects that are not super well funded, the people who are maintainers and contributors become overwhelmed and face a heavy tax on their time. And then you also have, and that tax sort of multiplies, I think in some cases exponentially for people who are testing and doing quality assurance because the more eyes you have on something, the more defects are identified. Is that sort of the phenomena that you're describing or is it a little bit more nuanced or elaborate than that? No, that's actually the phenomenon at a higher level. So yes, because more bugs are coming in, people have to spend more time. And of course the person is working on his or her or their free time or, you know, like it's a voluntary activity. So it's taking more it demands more. That's one aspect. And because of this increased demand, these new challenges, technical challenges are emerging, which requires more attention from the research community. As I said, it's a good thing because these challenges are emerging, but if they are left unattended, 
then of course it will need to burn out or like added work for that voluntary developer or contributor. And of course, that's not good. We don't want burnouts to happen. One of the things, Sean, that you mentioned is open source become a phenomenon like a meteor with such a big growth. What that is affecting, what Iftikhar had said is like it causes an issue of scale. More and more people are using, finding bugs, he said. More and more people are also contributing. But what that means is also quality control, right? If it's a small project, you might be easier be able to look at if the quality is matching, if the code style is matching, if the design of the architecture holds. But as it gets more and more people in, you know, too many cooks might sometimes spoil the broth. So if there is a lot of changes happening and when design discussions are not being able to be held properly, there might be design drift and slow deterioration of the product quality. And given it is open source, there might not be a key architect who stays all the time, but there might be more turnover. So where is institutional knowledge held? How it is documented and kept up to date? And how newcomers are actually getting to understand what is the vision? What are the central tenets of the project and how to build code towards that might be harder to maintain in an open source kind of an ecosystem than a closed source. So one of the things that you have thrown in here is the importance of implicit mentoring. And when I heard the term for the first time, I was like, what is that? Because I know mentoring in open source, like Google Summer of Code or Outreachy, where you get a project, you get assigned mentors within an open source project. And you're working on your specific project for a couple of weeks. And sometimes it's even paying a little stipend so you can focus on it a full time or part time. And that's when I think of mentoring, where you work closely with someone who has been in the community who can explain how to do things, overcome hurdles, how the community works. So what is implicit mentoring? So let me tell a quick short story. The story is like, as Anita was saying earlier, right? So my alma mater is Oregon State University. And as a student, I used to work with Anita a lot. So in recent times, like when we were discussing regarding one of our projects, this idea suddenly emerged that I have been learning a lot from her. As a faculty, as a professor, I have been learning from her, not necessarily in a document where it says, here, here are the advices for you. It's not like that. I have been learning through conversations through small interactions. And that led us to thinking like, isn't that what's happening in open source as well? Not only in open source, in any environment where people are interacting. As we said, open source is all about interactions between humans. So and that led us to start thinking along this line or down this line. And we did some dabbing, initial dabbing in the communication channels in open source. And we saw that, yes, Specifically, we were initially looking at pull requests and we saw that, yes, people are giving feedbacks or mentoring in the form of feedback. And again, it's not necessarily a structured Google summer of code or a formal mentor-mentee relationship, but telling that, oh, you should do this, you should write the code like this, or you should run this tool, it will identify some warnings, fix them. So the best practices that are being told through this kind of informal conversations in the form of pull request comments. So that's where this idea initiated or this thought initiated that it's implicit. It's not explicitly being mentioned that I am mentoring you. While open source software today is powering critical infrastructure, the open source ecosystem as a whole is rapidly changing, facing challenges for governance, maintenance, maintainer burnout, funding, marketing, and more. Are you concerned about these things for your open source software too? Well, in the Sustained community, we discuss these challenges and share solutions for how to sustain open source in the long haul. We meet once per year in person, and the rest of the time we keep the fire burning in our discourse forum. Join our conversations at sustainoss.org and sustain OSS on Twitter. So I have a little different story than Iktikars about the start of the project. As part of my earlier research, I have been looking at 
the barriers to contributing to open source. And one of the things we looked at also was the barriers that actually mentors face. And from that research and conversations with open source contributors, one of the things we found out was there is a lot of mentoring, helping, community engagement, nurturing the community that goes on, which are not always reflected in any of this uh, scaffolded forums or other places. So that got us to thinking about, okay, so there is mentoring going on and there is the Google Summer of Code and other places that are formal and explicit. We did some interviews and then we found out many people found informal mentoring to be actually more productive because then you are reaching out to people who you share interests with. And then there were those also that you have explicitly meeting with them, talking with them, having coffees. But then the things as we started discussing more came out was in the just everyday interactions, as Iftekar was saying, there is mentoring going on and in how you write the code and explaining why something should be done this way, either from a technical point of view or because of the project structure, project culture, right? So there's a lot of teaching, mentoring that actually goes on in everyday interactions. And we wanted to call that implicit mentoring because those are not explicitly stated. People are not saying, oh, I'm going to mentor if they are today, but we write this paper and we said, hey, you should not be doing this, but you know, we should write the paper this way because. So this like small little topical informally mentoring goes on implicitly while people are doing their everyday work. That's how we started coining this term as implicit mentoring. And these are the kinds of things that are necessary to bring new contributors into the fold and often a little bit more difficult to understand the mechanics of at scale. Yes, yes, totally. Yes. And that's why it being along with the technical artifact, like we started focusing on code reviews or pull request review comments, because there you have the technical content and you're giving very topical contextualized explanation and mentoring about how to do certain things in the project. One of the things I've observed about open source, riffing off that a little bit, is that I think coming into it, newcomers think open source is a single thing. And I think it takes a little while to figure out that every project or group of projects does the same technical things, but through a nominally or sometimes significantly different social process. And I'm wondering how that plays a role in the kind of research that you're doing. You know, in my own research, I tend to focus on a community at a time. And from that perspective, it becomes less mind boggling to understand the practices that that we can tease out of trace data or some computational linguistic analysis of how exchanges take place or how frequently they occur. But when I start looking and the contrast that exists in my own research is I looked a long time at corporatized software, things that through the Apache Software Foundation and the Linux Foundation. And recently I've turned some of my attention towards open source scientific software. And I see significantly different patterns of engagement and social approval or onboarding. So what we have in this particular research looked at is pull request comments, because as if the car was initially suggesting we were trying to find what data we have that we could parse and analyze using automated mechanisms like machine learning. And we used the pull request comments. And I believe we're in that place, more of the mentoring that was happening was about the technical aspects, but they did talk about which infrastructure to use or you would need to write a pull request in this way for it to be accepted. There was a little bit of the process knowledge being transferred through this pull request comments. But one of the things we had found out in the exploratory initial work before we started doing the data analysis was interviews. And there people had said they would converse a lot, not just about the technical aspects, but the social aspects about how to write a pull request, how to get approval or an initial idea of this is the right direction to take for the project, for this change you were making, or how to present the change to the rest of the community. And those kind of conversations from what I remember happen more through emails or video conferencing or just calling, right? Because there's a lot of uh, rich 
tacit knowledge that gets transferred, which is usually easier to do in a non-textual or like a broader than textual uh, mechanism. So this particular research has not focused on the social knowledge transfer versus the technical knowledge transfer, but that happens a lot. And my understanding or my suspicion is that there's a lot of that is actually not being recorded as a result of that mentor who's doing that kind of back and forth feedback conversations are actually not even getting acknowledged because that's all lost. So I get my change requests. I get a lot of help from Georg and how to address chaos, how to get into chaos, how to become my first successful contribution to chaos. And I thank him personally. And then I move on and become maybe the six star. But all that effort that Georg did through emails, voice calls, Zoom calls are kind of lost. Not because I did not want to acknowledge him, but just there's no mechanism to do that. So there's a lot of unacknowledged work that goes on now. And it was my pleasure, of course, making a star is all the things we have about. <laughs> so what have you learned about implicit mentoring? If we were to take a step back and say, okay, we have people listening to this podcast who now are wondering, what can I do to make implicit mentoring successful in my projects? What are some really good advice or another question that might tie into this? How do we know it's working well? What are some metrics we could maybe even look at or use to understand are we on the right track? So I guess there are two questions in this. So just to throw something like, what is implicit mentoring, right? So to us, an implicit mentoring was when there was a pull request comment that included an explanation about anything combining with the change, like explanation of why something should be done. And based on that, when we looked at the, we had 37 Apache projects that we analyzed. We found that about 27% of the pull requests had gotten implicit mentoring. So it's not the largest percentage, but there is quite a big chunk. And out of that, about 67% was paired. So one mentor and one mentee, but the rest were actually where multiple people had given feedback. Right? So there was triads and quadrats. 50% of that was top down, where someone more senior mentoring to someone junior. And we created a band of being, you're in the same age group, if you were six months of starting a project. So anybody who started the project within six months is considered a peer. Earlier than six months, a senior, less than after six months, a junior. So we had 50% that was top down and there were 34% that was peer to peer. So that's kind of the overall metrics that implicit mentoring is happening. One of the things what we are next research was to see how it impacts some kind of a metric. So we did look at how it affected pull request reopening. So we were trying to understand like if those pull requests have implicit mentoring comments, are they more complex? Do they have more chances of being reopened? Our results showed that those pull requests that had implicit mentoring were actually more complex ones, which kind of makes us believe that it is likely that pull requests that needed explanations and some kind of teaching were actually those that were more complicated and therefore needed more mentoring. One of the things we have done basic research is seeing as people are getting implicit mentoring, are they getting better in some way. And we are looking at betterment as a proxy of are they making more complex changes to the system. So yes, we will have to control for the experience they develop. But that's the one thing we want to look at is those who got implicit mentored, are they more likely to make more complex changes, maybe quicker than those who are not getting mentored. We did do research and we found that those who got implicit mentoring had more likelihood of staying in the project than those who did not get mentoring. So those are uh, metrics that they're calculating now with our students. It's not all done yet. Those are two metrics. So is explicit mentoring trying to help people be successful than being a maintainer who's looking at something critically, giving you the feedback about what you need to fix and going away? Is it simply a perspective of helpfulness compared to a perspective of critique? 
So the way we were looking at it explicit is if there is a, some kind of a formal partnership being done. So All right. yeah, if this explicit is formal, we have set up some meetings. If this explicitly part done, and as implicit is in a developer's maintainer's day-to-day activity, which is your part of your job, you are doing this additional mentoring that is implicitly done. So it's and not think, explicitly calling out. And I think the implicit seems like it would be, of course, much harder to tease out, but I think possibly easier to implement as well. Understanding those practices sounds very promising as something your ordinary maintainer could do without adding a, a large set of stuff to do to their plate. Just to add on top of that or answer Georg's second question, right? So what is the effect, right? Or what are some of the metrics that we have been looking at? So Anita already talked about two of them. Things that we haven't yet answered. I'm not answering the question, but like adding more questions to it is we are yet to investigate the effect of these implicit mentorings on, there are three things involved here, three parties essentially. One is the mentors. How is this affecting them? So how are they distributing this knowledge? So we found that, yes, we can identify these implicit mentorings, but like where they're happening, are there certain patterns, you know, like effect on the mentors. And then of course, effect on the mentees. And Anita touched on that point. There are two, three metrics that we thought of, but there are more other metrics that we haven't yet thought of. So when I get mentored, do I like literally write better quality code? Of course, that's another big, question like how do you define better quality those kind of effects or impact on the mentees and then of course overall like if i get mentored do i keep contributing or do i keep coming back or if i don't get mentored do i just leave so those are the impacts and in this paper or in this research we haven't yet answered those questions just wanted to add that awesome thank you it sounds like there's still a lot of questions that we have now that we have some initial idea of implicit mentoring and we have seen what that looks like. Now we have to think about how to actually make it more actionable and what impact does that have on the community. And so for this podcast episode, we talked about using the title, creating appreciative communities and implicit mentoring. How do we pull those two together? We have talked a lot about implicit mentoring. And I feel like the creating appreciative communities is part of that. But how do you see those two fitting together? So one of the first things we talked about, this is how I see the work in a broader context. For open source to be healthy, it needs to be able to attract newcomers and it has to be able to retain its current contributors. And to become that, it has to be more inclusive and be an appreciative community. So that's kind of the broader umbrella under which implicit mentoring forms. So there are a lot of different works, a lot of non-code work goes into creating a successful community, but those are currently invisible either because they're not recorded or because they are lost and not being persistent. Implicit mentoring is one way of identifying when in their development, everyday activities, software developers are taking this extra action teaching something, explaining, right? taking a little bit more action. So that is first attempt and finding some kind of an invisible work and towards how to build a more appreciative community. Now that we know where there are implicit mentors, can we have some way of acknowledging that? Like for example, have an at say mentor, just like you have an at author. That's one way. Maybe you can create some karma points their mentors get badges and karma points which trying to see where can we have non-code contributions a lot of community development activities being recognized because currently if you go to the github profile it's just a little green box which is mostly contributions which is like commits and pull requests code reviews i think are now being shown but you know how to make all this non-code community building activities as first level entities in, in, in source. And continuing with my theme of not answering, but adding more questions, like all these things, right? We hinted towards these ways of making this invisible work more, not explicit, but more visible. We hinted towards this and there are different, we recommended some actions, like one is giving karma points, those kind of things. Now, which one works best 
or which one is more effective for a certain open source project or for a certain committee that itself requires studies, right? An investigation, a longitudinal investigation to figure out, you know, like did that, did this work or does the other option work? So, you know, that's another line of work that we are thinking of. Obviously we need to do that to figure out which one works best or more, which one is more effective. And I think this is something where as an open source community or as a maintainer, just start doing experiments and see what sticks and see how the community responds. I mean, this is what chaos is about. We promote that, hey, you do something and then you look and reflect on the community. We have some metrics that can help you with that, but really think about, hey, what is working well? What can we improve? And if you try implicit mentoring, maybe provide more guidance and help with the interactions that you are having with other community members, then you're engaging in implicit mentoring. So do that, see if that helps. And then maybe it shows up in other metrics. I mean, we had already talked about types of contributions. There are many different ways. That's one of the chaos metrics, types of contributions, many different ways that we are contributing to open source. Time to first response was a metric that we mentioned earlier. So that might be interesting to track or metric issue label inclusivity and how we are building out our issue trackers is something that we can also create a community where people know how to get started. And then through implicit mentoring, we can help them along the path better. One quick addition, Georg, is yes. uh, review templates might be helpful. An example, good review, which, you know, talks about how implicit mentoring or explanation teaching moments going on. So that's another thing that Chaos initially, I think, had talked about is issue templating. And that has seriously made how the quality of issues way better than not having an issue template. So maybe something like having a review template might actually also help. Now, we are coming to the end of our time. And I feel like we, especially Iftakar, has raised more questions than we have answers for. So yep. where could people find you online and follow your work and be first to know once you find those answers? If you search for me at the University of California, Irvine, you can find me. I have also provided my Twitter handle, LinkedIn bio, everything I have already shared with you. So yeah, please feel free. And of course, as we do more work in this area, as we go deeper, things will be available online. And of course, on my webpage and Anita's webpage. Yeah, we'll add those links in the show notes for sure. So adding to that, my email is anita.sarma, first name, dot last name, at Oregon State EDU. Email is the best way to reach me. I do have Twitter and other social media handles, which I go once a month, maybe. So email is the best way to reach us. And we update our web pages, the university web pages with the latest paper. So that is where you will get it. If you have any questions or you want to participate in doing any kind of interventions, any kind of changes in your project, please contact us. I would love to work with you to create a more appreciative community. Thank you so much. I hope people will reach out to you because we can certainly use more appreciative communities around open source. And we like to end all of our episodes with a round of value ads where we share something that has brought value, joy, or meaning to our life recently. And I will start off. And as of recording this, I'm one week away from traveling out of town for a wedding. But the wedding is in Baltimore, but there's no direct flight. So we're actually flying to Washington, D.C. And our son is super excited for going to the capital of the United States for the first time, seeing the White House, seeing the Lincoln Memorial, seeing the Mirror Lake and the Capitol. That's been topic number one in our house for the last couple of weeks. And so I'm just super excited to go and be able to provide that experience also. And then, of course, the wedding. I'm super excited for the wedding. This is, we are in a quarter system. Uh, week seven just got over. So three more weeks and then I go on sabbatical. So I'm super excited to become sabbatical because then I can focus on 
this improving diversity and inclusion in open source. And Georg and I are actually contemplating writing a book on the subject. So that will be something I'm super excited about. It's actually bringing all these little bits and pieces of research and ideas that exist and bringing them together as a helpful resource for our community. I'm also looking forward to writing that book about how do we provide guidance and advice to someone who wants to work on diversity, equity, inclusion in open source. Yes. Super exciting project. I guess I can go next. So we welcomed our second son literally three months back. Congratulations. Uh, Thank you. And so he has started making those sounds that the three month old kids do. And that is the highlight of my day because, you know, when I see that, that gives me perspective. Yeah, that's something that I really look forward to every day. Thank you for sharing that. Sean, what is your value add today? My value add for today is that I can already feel it's becoming holiday season. And I have decided that this year is the year that I plan for us to win the war on Christmas. I'm kidding. That's uh, kind of a funny little thing for North Americans. Maybe not really funny, but dark at least. I'm looking forward to turkey in two weeks from yesterday. So I've got 13 days of this giant piece of animal fowl that we sit and eat and watch American style football with. And these are just some of my best memories as a child, getting up in the morning, eating the stuffing my mother made the night before, having her be upset that she has to go to the store to buy more stuffing, and then enjoying the Macy's parade and football. This time of the year is a fun time of the year. Yes, I agree. This is a great time of the year. I'm from India. So one of the things I missed is the lights and the festivals that goes from the like Diwali festival and stuff. So over here, I just absolutely love Christmas because it's dark outside and there's just so much lights. I just love all the bright lights and all the songs. I'm like, mm. when I'm into it, I listen to the Christmas carols and all that stuff. So I just love Christmas. Yeah, it really is the only time we do decorative exterior lighting in uh, the United States. All right. It is time to say thank you. Thank you, Iftika and Anita, for joining us today. So thank you, Georg, and thank you, Sean, for inviting us. It was really nice talking to you. And again, as I did, raising more questions than giving answers. So... Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 several times I held back from saying, well, that's just what a university professor does. <laughs> it was great to meet you, uh, Iftikhar, and uh, good to see you again, Georg and Anita. And thank you. This was fun. Thank you, Georg and Sean, for inviting us. It was fun to talk to you. And hopefully we get more and more people interested in building this appreciative community and give us more ideas about how to capture this invisible work that we got. Yeah, really. Thank you so much. Bye. Yeah. And thank you, thank you Sean, for joining us yeah. today as a panelist. And thank you, dear listener, for listening in today. And to stay up to date on future episodes, subscribe for free to this podcast on your favorite podcast app. Share this podcast with your friends and colleagues. And if you have ideas for future episode topics or would even like to come on as a guest, please email us podcast at chaos.community. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Until next time, your chaos community.